Chapter Five of Against the Grain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Martin Giessen. Against the Grain by Joris Carl Wismans. Translated by John Howard. Chapter Five. The afternoon was drawing to its close when a carriage halted in front of the Fontenay house. Since Des Essaintes received no visitors, and since the postman never even ventured into these uninhabited parts, having no occasion to deliver any papers, magazines, or letters, the servants hesitated before opening the door then as the bell was rung furiously again they peered through the peephole cut into the wall and perceived a man concealed from neck to waist behind an immense gold buckler they informed their master who was breakfasting ask him in he said for he recalled having given his address to a lapidary for the delivery of a purchase the man bowed and deposited the buckler on the pinewood floor of the dining-room it oscillated and wavered revealing the serpentine head of a tortoise which suddenly terrified retreated into its shell this tortoise was a fancy which had seized des Essaintes some time before his departure from paris examining an oriental rug one day in reflected light and following the silver gleams which fell on its web of plum violet and aladdin yellow it suddenly occurred to him how much it would be improved if he could place on it some object whose deep colour might enhance the vividness of its tints possessed by this idea he had been strolling aimlessly along the streets when suddenly he found himself gazing at the very object of his wishes there in a shop window on the palais royal lay a huge tortoise in a large basin he had purchased it then he had sat a long time with eyes half shut studying the effect decidedly the ethiopic black the harsh sienna tone of this shell dulled the rug's reflections without adding to it the dominant silver gleams in it barely sparkled crawling with lack-lustre tones of dead zinc against the edges of the hard tarnished shell he bit his nails while he studied a method of removing these discords and reconciling the determined opposition of the tones he finally discovered that his first inspiration which was to animate the fire of the weave by setting it off against some dark object was erroneous in fact this rug was too new too petulant and gaudy the colours were not sufficiently subdued he must reverse the process dull the tones and extinguish them by the contrast of a striking object which would eclipse all else and cast a golden light on the pale silver thus stated the problem was easier to solve he therefore decided to glaze the shell of the tortoise with gold the tortoise just returned by the lapidary shone brilliantly softening the tones of the rug and casting on it a gorgeous reflection which resembled the irradiations from the scales of a barbaric visigoth shield at first des Essaintes was enchanted with this effect then he reflected that this gigantic jewel was only in outline that it would not really be complete until it had been encrusted with rare stones from a japanese collection 
he chose a design representing a cluster of flowers emanating spindle-like from a slender stalk taking it to a jeweller he sketched a border to enclose this bouquet in an oval frame and informed the amazed lapidary that every petal and every leaf was to be designed with jewels and mounted on the scales of the tortoise the choice of stones made him pause the diamond has become notoriously common since every tradesman has taken to wearing it on his little finger the oriental emeralds and rubies are less vulgarized and cast brilliant rutilant flames but they remind one of the green and red antennae of certain omnibuses which carry signal lights of these colours as for topazes whether sparkling or dim they are cheap stones precious only to women of the middle class who like to have jewel cases on their dressing tables and then although the church has preserved for the amethyst a sacerdotal character which is at once unctuous and solemn this stone too is abused on the blood-red ears and veined hands of butchers wives who love to adorn themselves inexpensively with real and heavy jewels only the sapphire among all these stones has kept its fires undefiled by any taint of commercialism it sparks crackling in its limpid cold depths have in some way protected its shy and proud nobility from pollution unfortunately its fresh fire does not sparkle in artificial light the blue retreats and seems to fall asleep only awakening to shine at daybreak none of these satisfied des Esseintes at all they were too civilized and familiar he let trickle through his fingers still more astonishing and bizarre stones and finally selected a number of real and artificial ones which used together should produce a fascinating and disconcerting harmony this is how he composed his bouquet of flowers the leaves were set with jewels of a pronounced distinct green the chrysoberyls of asparagus green the chrysolites of leek green the olivines of olive green they hung from branches of almandine and uvarovite of a violet red darting spangles of a hard brilliance like tartar micas gleaming through forest depths for the flowers separated from the stalk and removed from the bottom of the sheaf he used blue cinder but he formally waved that oriental turquoise used for brooches and rings which like the banal pearl and the odious coral serves to delight people of no importance he chose occidental turquoise exclusively stones which properly speaking are only a fossil ivory impregnated with coppery substances whose sea blue is choked opaque sulphurous as though yellowed by bile this done he could now set the petals of his flowers with transparent stones which had morbid and vitreous sparks feverish and sharp lights he composed them entirely with ceylon snapdragons cymophanes and blue chalcedony these three stones darted mysterious and perverse scintillations painfully torn from the frozen depths of their troubled waters the snapdragon of a greenish grey streaked with concentric veins which seemed to stir and change constantly according to the dispositions of light 
the cymophane whose azure waves float over the milky tint swimming in its depths the blue chalcedony which kindles with bluish phosphorescent fires against a dead brown chocolate background the lapidary made a note of the places where the stones were to be inlaid and the border of the shell he asked des Essaintes. at first he had thought of some opals and hydrophanes but these stones interesting for their hesitating colours for the evasions of their flames are too refractory and faithless the opal has a quite rheumatic sensitiveness the play of its rays alters according to the humidity the warmth or cold as for the hydrophane it only burns in water and only consents to kindle its embers when moistened he finally decided on minerals whose reflections vary for the compostelle hyacinth mahogany red the beryl glaucous green the ballas ruby vinegar rose the pseudomanian ruby pale slate their feeble sparklings sufficed to light the darkness of the shell and preserved the values of the flowering stones which they encircled with a slender garland of vague fires des Essaintes now watched the tortoise squatting in a corner of the dining-room shining in the shadow he was perfectly happy his eyes gleamed with pleasure at the resplendencies of the flaming corolli against the gold background then he grew hungry a thing that rarely if ever happened to him and dipped his toast spread with a special butter in a cup of tea a flawless blend of shafayun moyutan and khansky yellow teas which had come from china to russia by special caravans this liquid perfume he drank in those chinese porcelains called eggshell so light and diaphanous they are and as an accompaniment to these adorable cups he used a service of solid silver slightly gilded the silver showed faintly under the fatigued layer of gold which gave it an aged quite exhausted and moribund tint after he had finished his tea he returned to his study and had the servant carry in the tortoise which stubbornly refused to budge the snow was falling by the lamplight he saw the icy patterns on the bluish windows and the hoar-frost like melted sugar scintillating in the stumps of bottles spotted with gold a deep silence enveloped the cottage drooping in shadow des Essaintes fell into reverie the fireplace piled with logs gave forth a smell of burning wood he opened the window slightly like a high tapestry of black ermine the sky rose before him black flecked with white an icy wind swept past accelerated the crazy flight of the snow and reversed the colour order the heraldic tapestry of heaven returned became a true ermine a white flecked with black in its turn by the specks of darkness dispersed among the flakes he closed the window this abrupt transition from torrid warmth to cold winter affected him he crouched near the fire and it occurred to him that he needed a cordial to revive his flagging spirits he went to the dining-room where built into one of the panels was a closet containing a number of tiny casks ranged side by side and resting on small stands of sandalwood this collection of barrels 
he called his mouth organ a stem could connect all the spigots and control them by a single movement so that once attached he had only to press a button concealed in the woodwork to turn on all the taps at the same time and fill the mugs placed underneath the organ was now open the stops labelled flute horn celestial voice were pulled out ready to be placed des Esseintes sipped here and there enjoying the inner symphonies succeeded in procuring sensations in his throat analogous to those which music gives to the ear moreover each liquor corresponded according to his thinking to the sound of some instrument dry curathau for example to the clarinet whose tone is sourish and velvety cumul to the oboe whose sonorous notes snuffle mint and anisette to the flute at once sugary and peppery puling and sweet while to complete the orchestra kirschwasser has the furious ring of the trumpet gin and whisky burn the palate with their strident crashings of trombones and cornets brandy storms with the deafening hubbub of tubers while the thunderclaps of the cymbals and the furiously beaten drum roll in the mouth by means of the raki of chios he also thought that the comparison could be continued that quartets of string instruments could play under the palate with the violin simulated by old brandy fumous and fine piercing and frail the tenor violin by rum louder and more sonorous the cello by the lacerating and lingering ratafia melancholy and caressing with the double bass full-bodied solid and dark as the old bitters if one wished to form a quintet one could even add a fifth instrument with the vibrant taste the silvery detached and shrill note of dry cumin imitating the harp the comparison was further prolonged tone relationships existed in the music of liquors to sight but one note benedictine represents so to speak the minor key of that major key of alcohols which are designated in commercial scores under the name of green chartreuse these principles once admitted he succeeded after numerous experiments in enjoying silent melodies on his tongue mute funeral marches in hearing in his mouth solos of mint duos of ratafia and rum he was even able to transfer to his palate real pieces of music following the composer step by step rendering his thought his effects his nuances by combinations or contrasts of liquors by approximative and skilled mixtures at other times he himself composed melodies executed pastorals with mild black current which evoked in his throat the trillings of nightingales with the tender shuva cocoa which sang saccharine songs like the romance of estelle and the ah shall i tell you mamma of past days but on this evening des Esseintes was not inclined to listen to this music he confined himself to sounding one note on the keyboard of his organ by swallowing a little glass of genuine irish whisky he sank into his easy chair and slowly inhaled this fermented juice of oats and barley a pronounced taste of creosote was in his mouth gradually as he drank 
his thought followed the now revived sensitiveness of his palate fitted its progress to the flavour of the whisky reawakened by a fatal exactitude of odours memories effaced for years this carbolic tartness forcibly recalled to him the same taste he had had on his tongue in the days when dentists worked on his gums once abandoned on this track his reverie at first dispersed among all the dentists he had known concentrated and converged on one of them who was more firmly engraved in his memory it had happened three years ago seized in the middle of the night with an abominable toothache he put his hand to his cheek stumbled against the furniture pacing up and down the room like a demented person it was a molar which had already been filled no remedy was possible only a dentist could alleviate the pain he feverishly waited for the day resolved to bear the most atrocious operation provided it would only ease his sufferings holding a hand to his jaw he asked himself what should be done the dentists who treated him were rich merchants whom one could not see at any time one had to make an appointment he told himself that this would never do that he could not endure it he decided to patronize the first one he could find to hasten to a popular tooth extractor one of those iron-fisted men who if they are ignorant of the useless art of dressing decaying teeth and of filling holes know how to pull the stubbornest stump with an unequalled rapidity there the office opened early in the morning and one is not required to wait seven o'clock struck at last he hurried out and recollecting the name of a mechanic who called himself a dentist and dwelt in the corner of a key he rushed through the streets holding his cheek with his hands repressing the tears arrived in front of the house recognizable by an immense wooden signboard where the name of gatonax sprawled in enormous pumpkin-coloured letters and by two little glass cases where false teeth were carefully set in rose-coloured wax he gasped for breath he perspired profusely a horrible fear shook him a trembling crept under his skin suddenly a calm ensued the suffering ceased the tooth stopped paining he remained stupefied on the sidewalk finally he stiffened against the anguish mounted the dim stairway running up four steps at a time to the fourth story he found himself in front of a door where an enamel plate repeated inscribed in sky-blue lettering the name on the signboard he rang the bell and then terrified by the great red spittles which he noticed on the steps he faced about resolved to endure his toothache all his life at that moment an excruciating cry pierced the partitions filled the cage of the doorway and glued him to the spot with horror at the same time that a door was opened and an old woman invited him to enter his feeling of shame quickly changed to fear he was ushered into a dining-room another door creaked and in entered a terrible grenadier dressed in a frock coat and black trousers des Esseintes followed him to another room from this instant his sensations were confused he vaguely remembered having sunk into a chair opposite a window having murmured as he put a finger to his tooth 
it has already been filled and i am afraid nothing more can be done with it the man immediately suppressed these explanations by introducing an enormous index finger into his mouth muttering beneath his waxed fang-like moustaches he took an instrument from the table then the play began clinging to the arms of his seat des esseintes felt a cold sensation in his cheek and began to suffer unheard agonies then he beheld stars he stamped his feet frantically and bleated like a sheep about to be slaughtered a snapping sound was heard the molar had broken while being extracted it seemed that his head was being shattered that his skull was being smashed he lost his senses howled as loudly as he could furiously defending himself from the man who rushed at him anew as if he wished to implant his whole arm in the depths of his bowels brusquely recoiled a step and lifting the tooth attached to the jaw brutally let him fall back into the chair breathing heavily his form filling the window he brandished at one end of his forceps a blue tooth with blood at one end faint and prostrate des esseintes spat blood into a basin refused with a gesture the tooth which the old woman was about to wrap in a piece of paper and fled after paying two francs expectorating blood in his turn down the steps he at length found himself in the street joyous feeling ten years younger interested in every little occurrence Phew! he exclaimed saddened by the assault of these memories he rose to dissipate the horrible spell of this vision and returning to reality began to be concerned with the tortoise it did not budge at all and he tapped it the animal was dead doubtless accustomed to a sedentary existence to a humble life spent underneath its poor shell it had been unable to support the dazzling luxury imposed on it the rutilant cope with which it had been covered the jewels with which its back had been paved like a pyx end of chapter 5 Recording by Martin Giessen in Hazelmere, Surrey.